The only place that you can kiss yourself in a mirror is on the lips. It's just optics. You should wash the mirror first, because there's feces on it, probably. There's feces on everything, especially your phone, and you always have that close to your mouth. <laughs> Poop on the phone. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the show where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections from the previous week of nerdery that we got up to on this channel, and then address it and help build out this tiny little universe of ours, and mostly mine, but also ours. Almost half a million subs in under six months. Keep it going, please. So let's get right into it. On the last episode of Because Science, I said that I was going to take you to one of the quietest places on Earth, and I did. It's in Minneapolis, Minnesota at Orfield Labs. It was the quietest place on Earth, but it is the quietest place on Earth that you can go in for a tour, like I did. And I said that you would want to have your home or your life kind of like an anechoic chamber, like we saw at Orfield Labs, if you wanted to escape aliens that hunted by sound, like in the film A Quiet Place with Jim Halpert Krasinski. It was really, really quiet in there. Most really good anechoic chambers like that will have a mesh floor because they will also, they'll have panels all the way around, but on the, they'll also have a pit with panels. And so you don't fall into the pit, they have mesh that you can walk over. When I was in the chamber, they had plywood over that so we could walk in it uh, no problem and nothing fell through. And when you lean over where the plywood was, you can almost feel the sound fall off a cliff because you're among you're, you're right at the edge of where the pit of no returning sound starts. It's really cool and trippy. And when you're in a place that quiet, you can hear almost everything, just like an alien hunting you would if you were, you know, trying to hide from it. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Sean the Bows and James Quest who say some version of, well, if the aliens had super sensitive hearing, couldn't you use a very loud or very intense sound to hurt the aliens' ears because they're so sensitive and that's how you could defeat them? Well, in the film A Quiet Place, that's kind of what happens, but it would really depend on the physiology of the alien. Our ears, which is really cool, our ears aren't just passive. They don't just sit there and absorb the sound. When you hear a really, really loud sound that's close to the threshold for pain, our bodies in, inside of our ear, they can tighten up the eardrum so it doesn't vibrate as much and so it can withstand more pressure and the tiny bones, the tiniest bones in your body inside of your ear can pull back a little bit so it doesn't vibrate the inner ear as much. So your ear can actually protect itself from sound. Now, if the aliens in a quiet place could do something similar with their highly evolved ears, then maybe it would take something incredibly intense or powerful to damage them, and then you'd have to deal with that. Something like a shockwave from a bomb or something, but then again, that's just a shockwave. So it depends on alien biology. They might have a really high tolerance for sound. Their threshold for pain could also be higher than our threshold for pain, like their threshold is lower than ours for hearing. They could have a larger dynamic range. It's plausible. <laughs> It's plausible. I think we could all agree that's plausible. Our next comment comes from a number of people who I'm not going to name because they just want to get into this show. You know what? I'm not even gonna give you the satisfaction. You're wasting potential. Get in there and get nerdy and then I'll feature your words. Nate. Someone missed opportunities. You're failing me. Our next comment comes from Vincent Shu, who says, because silence. Oh, nailed it. Our next comment comes from David W. who says, I know it's figured out at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, that blah, 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 but I didn't think they gave humanity enough credit in defending themselves from the aliens. We could have figured this out and defeated them in some way. Sure, a lot of people had problems with how quickly the aliens, just hunting by sound alone, wiped out all of humanity in a quiet place, but I like what John Krasinski said in his vision of this movie as he was directing it. The, the aliens arriving on Earth is what it would be like if you released a pack of wolves into a daycare, which would be...
Link. Our next comment comes from Curtis Lewis and Carlos Staley, who are asking about the void. Why would you take us to the quietest place on Earth? You were in a void, so weren't you already in a completely uh, quiet place, the quietest place? Because I said being in the quietest place on Earth, an anechoic chamber, for example, is like having an infinitely large room around you. A lot of questions about the void this week, but I said that I was taking you to the quietest place on Earth. Earth. Our next comment comes from Daniel Duncan, who says, uh, the quietest place sounds like your heartbeat, it sounds like you're breathing, it sounds like your clothes rubbing against your skin, it sounds like your eyes blinking. It's a little bit more insane than you would think. These are sounds that your brain actually ignores. But when that is all there is to hear, your brain pays attention to it too much. Yes, your brain edits out a lot of everyday experience or adds in everyday experience. Your conscious life is like a movie that's being edited in real time. Things are being taken out and things are being put in without your conscious knowledge. Whenever you move your eyes rapidly, let's say, and it's not following like an arc, a constant arc, if they're making saccades, which are little jumpy motions, and that's what happens when you look across uh, horizontally, let's say, you are functionally blind from when your eyes here to when your eyes here. You can try it, you go like that but you don't see any blackness. That is because your brain is actively filling in the background of what it thinks it should see based on the visual information that it, that it is uh, absorbing. So your conscious life uh, is a lie. But yes, your brain is also editing out a lot of everyday body sounds and stuff, just like how you can see your own nose right now. I know, you couldn't see it until I said that, but it's always, it is always in your field of vision your brain just kind of edits it out. Don't worry, your brain will forgive me in a second. How's that big old schnoz affecting your viz? But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Watchmiker, who says, sup dude? So owls have specialized feathers that help them fly almost completely silent, which is cool. Interestingly, there are also birds that have feathers that do the exact opposite. Several types of dove actually have specialized feathers that produce sound when moved in a certain way. The feathers are used as a warning to other birds and have even been shown to have different tones for different threats. Thanks for the fun. And you know what? Thanks, Mike, for the interesting information. I love knowing that kind of stuff because I supplant cocktail party talk with that kind of stuff because nothing's going on in here. So you, Mike, <laughs> are a super nerd. I mean, you hear it? That's my feather threat for TMI. But I'm not always right. I thought Liv Tyler and Alicia Silverstone were the same person. They are not. You know why? Because of that song in Armageddon with Liv Tyler, whose dad is Aerosmith, who has a video with Alicia Silverstone in it. I thought the three were twain. Wait, the same. Mark the same, I don't know. Anyway, I'm wrong a lot. So what was I wrong about in the last episode? Our first correction comes from Dano BG, who says, isn't it hair cells and not actually legitimate hairs? So let me be a little bit more clear. In your inner ear, it's not actually hair, like in your nose or on your arm or the rest of your body. It's hair cells that have hair-like projections that look like this. This is inside of a frog's inner ear. So they're not actually hairs. I should have been more clear and, conf and less confusing because I even confused myself on that, so. Thanks. Our next correction comes from Jim Spinner who says, just a quick thought, wouldn't the use of sound masking be just as effective as making your home sound proof? Like generating white noise in all directions that could mask what you are doing underneath that white noise. That actually happens in a quiet place when they go to talk near a waterfall because it's a louder noise that's drowning out the smaller noise. On that note, I should mention that sound proofing isn't the same as what we saw in the quietest place on Earth. That anechoic foam 
acts to deaden echoes, but it doesn't completely soundproof a room. Chambers like that are chambers within chambers within chambers that are surrounded in each chamber wall by like inches of steel and inches of concrete and then a pocket of air and then another box of concrete and steel and then more. So there's a lot of soundproofing that also goes into it, so you would need that. But you are right, a lot of people had this comment about the movie is like, why didn't they just live near a waterfall or generate loud noise? to mask their movements and their speech. Well, living near a waterfall probably isn't as easy or conducive to actual life, especially when you're trying to have a family uh, than living in a nice barn. And if you're trying to generate white noise, you would have to, all the setup, you would need electricity, which might not be readily available in the apocalypse, and you would have all of this upkeep. I think what John Krasinski did is go for the simplest option, which was just to be quiet, uh, which I can see as a directorial decision. I think, I think it's fine. I think it was a fun little tweak. So could you hide underneath ambient noise? Sure but you'd still have monsters checking out that ambient noise anyway. And do you wanna even, do you wanna be near them? I don't think so. <coughs> no. No. Range. The next correction comes from Zen, who says that shark blood thing is a myth. So at the beginning of last week's episode, I mentioned that sharks can taste or smell or whatever it feels like to them. What was it like to be a shark? Probably very choppy. Anyway, they can smell or taste a drop of blood in a large volume of water. Now that's not exactly a myth. What is a myth is that sharks can instantaneously detect a drop of blood in uh, the ocean proper. Now their, their sense of smell isn't quite that good, but it is amazing. Some sharks can detect blood up to one part per million, which is like detecting just a milliliter, a drop of blood in 25 gallons of seawater, which is really impressive. And from up to 500 yards away, five football fields away, which is still pretty incredible when you consider that the drops of blood still have to be diffused through water. It needs to ride ocean currents and get all the way to the shark. And as it does that, it's gonna become less and less concentrated. And so it's the, the signal will be smaller and smaller and smaller. So sharks do have an amazing sense of smell slash taste, but it is not instantaneous detection in an entire ocean's volume worth of water. You're right. But the best correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to one-time super nerd already, Sean Perry, who says, actually, at negative 80 decibels, the sound would not be 100 times quieter. So at the very end of my episode, I said that I found a very weird uh, figure that said that negative 80 decibels would be the sound, if you could hear it, of a shrimp chewing on food hundreds of meters away while you were listening to it in a nuclear submarine at the bottom of the ocean. So incredibly quiet. And I said offhand, that'd be, you know, a hundred times quieter than this sound that I was making. A hundred times quieter. But what Sean says is that the difference between one and two decibel wise is measured logarithmically. So if we assume that we heard a one decibel sound from me, which would be incredibly quiet, then it wouldn't be a hundred times quieter from the shrimp eating that food away from me underwater in a submarine. It would be a hundred million times quieter. Oh, he said, Dr. Evil Pinky. Dr. Evil Pinky. Oh, right, not like Pinky in the brain, right. The difference wouldn't be a hundred times quieter. It would be 100 million times quieter. Sean, I just checked myself in a very roundabout fashion, and you are right. Yes, it would be a hundred million times quieter, not just a hundred, and that is awesome, especially if you love watching shrimp eat. I mean, it is pretty soothing. And for that, you are indeed a super nerd number two time, two time, woo! Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do so at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you already saw it two days earlier than everyone else. And if you go there, you can get a free trial and see one of my other shows that's currently running called Natural Selection, which is a really fun debate show that I do with my friend and colleague Dan Casey, who's very witty and very funny, and we argue science versus fiction, so you should check it out. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is is going to be why you do not actually want the power of invisibility. Can you still see me? That's right, in this week's episode, I am going back to our kind of 
undefined series that we do every so often that is you do not want X superpower and this time it is invisibility like super strength and super speed if you think about this power scientifically and its consequences I don't think this is something that you'd actually want so go watch the latest episode of because science if you haven't yet about the quietest place on earth and let me know your comments questions and corrections at youtube.com slash because science facebook.com slash because science it's an easy way to watch and on social media at because science also if you are in the San Diego area this week. I will be at Comic-Con all week with Nerdist. We have an awesome space at Sparks Gallery, which is open to the public, and there will be uh, programming all day, every day, live, signings, merch, meet and greet. I'll be there doing the meet and greet, selling new merch, doing a panel, doing Because Science Live. I want to see you there, and we can fist bump, because it is more hygienic. Don't touch me. And don't forget, it's really easy to get stuck in a phone loop without thinking about it. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes you get stuck, and instead of thinking about how you're feeling about something or having any real moments of introspection, you just kind of, wow, I wonder, why, why am I sad right now? Nope. Oh, I wonder how I could, nope. It's really easy to get stuck in that loop. Sometimes that happens to me. And I think the only real remedy for it is to just sometimes walk off into the woods. <laughs> That's what I do. I walk off into the woods never to be seen again. No, but seriously, go sit in some grass and look at bugs. I'm that guy. It's refreshing and it helps your eyes and bugs are cool. I feel like I'm not giving a great pitch for it. Yeah, phone is great. Interaction with people all over the world is great, but every once in a while you need to walk into the woods and watch all the trees sway in the same way under the same wind and feel as one of them. Bye.